Hello, I'm Dan Jennings, and ten years ago I gave up my life's dream of being a radio presenter with one big regret, never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul, the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast for the fans, by the fans. So why Paul Weller? Well, during the course of this podcast series, I'll attempt to explain why his music means so much to me personally. And we'll also hear from fellow fans, people who know him and love him, those that have worked with him, plus industry insiders who play his music on the radio, collaborate with him on his videos, music and gigs, journalists who have written about him and spent time with him on tour or in his studio. In fact, anyone and everyone with a link to Paul who wants to celebrate everything Weller is welcome on the podcast. So let's kick off episode two. And this episode is called The Mumper but more on that shortly. First, what an exciting few weeks it's been since we announced the podcast was coming. We celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Jam Sound Effects album, one of their very finest, with songs like Pretty Green, Monday, Start, That's Entertainment, Boy About Town. We've had the announcement of rescheduled tour dates for 2021. Disappointing that it's had to be shifted away from next March, but excitement with the addition of new dates for Bath, Sheffield and Lincoln all added to the run at the back end of next year. We've seen publication of Simon Halfon's Cover to Cover book, an incredible piece of work featuring album covers, tour artwork and merchandise for the Jam, Style Council and the solo years, and more on that to come. I'm hoping we can chat to Simon on a future episode too. And most exciting of all, the reveal of a new album coming from Paul Weller in May 2021 is going to be called Fat Pop Volume 1, which means this podcast now has an end goal. An interview with the man himself at the launch of what I think is solo album number 15. You can tweet the podcast at Weller Fan Pod. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google, basically anywhere and everywhere that you get your podcasts. Heck, you can even ask Alexa, play the podcast Desperately Seeking Paul. And to kick off episode two, my special guest is Mark Baxter, or Bax as he is well known by, who is a bit of a London legend, although he wouldn't admit to it himself. An amazing man who has always carried the ethos of modernism throughout his life and career. A writer, filmmaker, PR man known as The Mumper, which is both his Twitter handle and the title of one of his brilliant books. Together with Lee Cogswell, he runs Mono Media, a company that has been there throughout the life cycle of Paul's recent albums from the Jawbone soundtrack to A Kind Revolution to True Meanings through to 2020's incredible summer lockdown saviour on Sunset. Exclusive behind-the-scenes documentaries that they have produced have been a real joy for us fans. Plus, in November 2020, through the magic of their Sky Arts documentary on the Style Council, we were transported back to the 1980s, with a huge treat for fans of Paul, Mick, Steve and Dee, and the incredible music that they produced. And I'm still watching that end twist on a daily basis. Wow. Now let's get into it with the legend that is Mark Baxter. Welcome, Bax. Uh, Well, most people call me Bax. Yeah, I'm happy with that. And um, yeah, that's fine with me, mate. (laughs) All right, Bax. When was it you first heard about Paul Weller? Um, um, Can you remember a kind of song or a moment? When You're Young, what a jam. Good song. Because, uh, yeah, I don't know what year that was, actually, but I I, I always think around 78, 79. So, yeah, I would have been 16, 15, 16, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it was all wrapped up in the, uh, the quadrophenia, the jam, the, the mod revival thing was coming. Um, I'm from a, my background is my dad's an old pub singer. So he, he was more like a, a teddy boy, but I had uncles who were in the mod world and they had like great singles collections and, um, you know, four tops, stacks, Otis, small faces, all that stuff. And they had all that stuff. And I was like, I mean, I'm only a kid, but I had just started to discover them singles around that time. So obviously the jam and, and, and the, the film and that old era of sort of scooters and the clothing and, all, and I love all that stuff. So that was when I first sort of got into it. But I was more of a football man than a music man. So I, all my money went to go and see football and be a wall supporter. So I wasn't really a gig man. It was more of a football man. So it was late. I sort of appreciated the music and I started buying singles. But I was more into going to the away games and football and stuff and, and didn't have a lot of money. So it, it all went into that. But then later, I, I, when Paul broke the jam up uh, at the start of council, time 83, 4, that's when I started going to gigs on a regular basis. So I love the jam, I love the energy, I love the music, but I it was a bit, um, as you said himself, like a bit like being in the army, jam, like the jam army. It was all everyone looked pretty much the same. Yeah. Load of geezers, a lot of aggravation, you know. I mean I was used to that football, I didn't need it when I went out and night out really. <laughs> uh, so I was I was more into the so when he started sort of more 
European sensibility and the clothing and it all sort of softened a little bit and the jazz and, the, and I was ready for that move I mean I've been I've done all that sort of uh, mod revival sort of pub gigs and whatever and I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on quite quickly I've always done it in my life from every 18 months two years I want to something else I've always done that it's just my nature after I've done a bit of the jam and, and, and they've finished and I, the style council just kept moving all the time that band was always every six months new look new haircut new something and it was that was the perfect group for me to pin my colours to, really, and then and go with. And I learned so much with that, you know, music, film, theatre, books, because that's what he was like. He was just feeding us, up, for, like, for me anyway, he was feeding us all that information by, for interviews and stuff. I loved the jam and loved, even looking back, he still loved hearing it and stuff, but I found the style council so much more interesting. And then I then discovered that obviously Paul was a very interesting guy because before we, I didn't pin as a, you know, an angry young man type of fella. All of a sudden, he's completely changing that round. He's and he's talking about you know blue note jazz and you know cappuccinos and it's that, that you know it's a bit cliche now, but it, it was like wow, this is incredible. This guy's now he's now this and he's that and he's that and he's that and he's that. And I loved all that. I loved all that. It's interesting when you talk about the kind of following and and the and I think that's kind of featured a little bit in terms of like the whole career. I remember going to quite, you know gigs. I, I've been a Weller fan, I would guess, since the since the solo years. So I kind of discovered him, right. yeah, you know, right back with Aha, Oh Yeah, and Into Tomorrow, and then and then discovered this incredible. Kind of back catalogue and the jam and the style council and stuff but every time you went to a gig you'd see everybody with the kind of weller haircut and then suddenly you had a different haircut so those people must have been so yeah. frustrated of kind of like oh god yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the style no, council it, like you say every six months that look was changing wasn't it it's incredible not- i mean i was um running a small business already like behind a little stall down camden and i was meeting loads of guys who later become was in groups like galliano which again like sort of stuff i love which is like that acid jazz sort of Giles Peterson, so like getting that jazz thing, the Dingwalls thing. It took me on a journey that um, from where I'm from, and most of my peer group wouldn't, wouldn't go on that journey. They were like, you know, they got married young and kids young and got an house. That was it. That got a job. That would do me. Whereas I was always wanting to know what is, there's more out there, like following someone like Paul, whether he likes it or not, or whether he knew anything about it or not. It just took you on that journey. And um, yeah, I mean, he would change so much. He was like a comedian. And you say that people go to a gig and then they'd be, they'd be like, oh, shit, the haircut's out of date. So. <laughs> But they, but they stuck with it for that gig, and it was just always moving. And that, that I, I got into that massively. I, I, I loved that sort of side to him, really. And, and even now, like you know, he's still he's still going forward all the time, which is incredible energy to to keep discovering new ways of attacking music. I mean, it's quite. I know the body of work is astounding, but it, every now and again, he still comes up with something crazy. And you're thinking oh, it's just a gift. It's got to be a gift. It's not something. You, Obviously, he works it and he and he and he refines it. But um, all these years later, he's still you know producing stuff. You're thinking that's just ridiculous, that's ridiculous. But he still can do that. It's obviously something from a bit higher than uh, just yeah. You know, like, like, it's definitely like a, yeah, a God-given talent there, isn't it? Yeah, I, think, you... I mean, you know, it sounds a bit what's the name when you start talking about it. But you, you can't. I can't quantify it any other way. I can't do it. I mean, I've tried, and people say, well, you know, how does he, how does, how does he keep doing it? And, and he'll throw it away, but I said, oh, well, just, you know, it's something I'll do. Oh, this, is, this is a bit deeper than that, really, you know. Your company, uh, Mono Media Films, have, have been yeah. kind of, had kind of exclusive access, I guess, for the kind of past, I guess, what, five years maybe, since since the Jawbone yeah. soundtrack. Would that be right? So you've kind of been there, and you've produced yeah. these kind of making of documentaries. So you've you've seen the kind of writing and the studio work in person. That must be such an exciting thrill yeah, for be, a fan, yeah? Yeah, to be fair, I mean, I, I first, going back a little bit, I was first, I was obviously a fan, but I first met him properly in um, at a sound check at the Under Club in uh, 2005. And the first thing, I know, it was, I was introduced by, to him by, with Paolo Hewitt. I did a couple of books with Paolo, who was a big, big friend of Paul's at the time. And Paul's first words were, what you're listening to, what you're reading, what you've seen on telly, what you've been in theatre lately. It was just, it wasn't what, it wasn't like, hello mate, I need another fan. It wasn't like that. It was like, if you're going to stand here, you better be able to come up with, he didn't say this, but he was intimating, you know, what have you got? And then I was quite quick on my feet because I've always, I was saying, I'm, right, I'm currently reading this, so I've been to see that. I didn't see him very often, but when we did, we did meet up, he was saying, check this out, check that out. So I got into that sort of, a small part of his world, of, like if, if I saw him, um, it would be a little conversation. Now, I'm a fan. I'm a super fan. So that's quite incredible for me. That's enough for me. But over the course of like the next sort of 15 years of that, I started obviously writing books and doing mainly books at the time and then decided to set up a film company with um, a guy called Lee Cogswell in 2013, which is one of media films. And basically because I've done 10 books, 12 books at the time, I wanted to try a film 
uh, documentary and I had no idea really what I was doing but Lee Lee has got all the technical ability in the world I'm the other side of it we're like yin and yang I, I've got all the chat and the rabbit yeah. I can find I can find investors I can get you access I can get whatever you want I then go all yours you make it and that's what we did we made a film on a, on a jazz guy called Tubby Hayes a big jazz man and Tubby was a, a, a English player a saxophone player who played with the best in the world you know with Duke Elliott and, and you know he was he was he was he was that high at Fitzgerald and then Paul found out about the film the company found out about it he, he was like what are you up to? And I said, well, I've set this film company up. He said, anything I could do to help? I said, well, you know, any support, anything you can, any ideas. And he got right behind it. He wouldn't join it as a, he wouldn't join it as a company. He just left it as me and Lee, but he would, he would sort of give us ideas. He would give us some contacts. He would put us in touch with people at the BBC. He was working away beyond the scenes. And that's what, that's what he's always done. He's always supported any ideas you might have. Did he get like an exec producer credit on the documentary? Well, that's, I want it to be part of our company. He wouldn't do it. So I wanted him to be a, 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 like a director, and he wouldn't do it. No, no, no. You, should, you, know, you do it. You do it. You know? I mean, but I, I, everybody who give me like some money or some help or some their time on that film, because it, bearing in mind we've still financed that. So I was, I was big borrowing. I don't say stealing, but I was certainly on the back basically to yeah. get it made. I mean, we made it for thirty-five grand that film. When normally, normally you're looking at least hundred grand to make those documentaries with the archive and stuff. So we made it on on no money. Because everyone gave us so much time and effort, everybody involved with that film. So a lot of them got exec producer old title credit because without them it wouldn't have happened. It just wouldn't. It just would not have got made. So he went on that, and he liked that. He liked the fact that he was part of something, but he didn't have to do too much on it. it just it was our way of um, nodding to him, saying thanks very much for the help and the, the assistance. Well, and that was it. So when Jaw, but the Jawbone film was uh, written by a mate of mine called Johnny Harris, an actor who was the lead actor in the film. Unbeknownst to Johnny, Johnny gave me the script. It was like 60 pages. And it, was, so it wasn't finished. It's normally around 90, 95 pages for a finished script. It wasn't finished, but I absolutely loved it because I knew John was a personal friend of mine. He said, have a read that, what do you think? I was at a gig that Paul was doing um, at Made of Our Studios and, and I and then after the gig, he was sort of talking and someone said, what do you want to do? He said, I'd love to score a film. I don't want to do a Hollywood film. I want to do like a, an art house film. So, Minute it finished, I left him alone and went and found his manager, Claire. And I said to Claire, look, have a read that. And she was like, oh, Bex, you know, look, we're getting undated with his stuff. I said, obviously, have a read that. I think I think you'll get that. Because it was about boxing. It was about drinking. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen the film, but it's a great... Yeah, it's, a nice, it's brilliant. Great. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, there's so many layers. There's lonely yeah. layers to that film. Because most people think, oh, it's a boxing film. No, no, no. It's much deeper than that. No, it's heartbreaking. I mean, there's, a, there's a scene in the... Um... He's in the job centre, I think, or the old yeah. health centre, getting, getting his money yeah. or asking for his money yeah. and it's not coming. It's heartbreaking at points. Oh, it's, well. it's a tremendous, yeah, I mean, amazing. And Paul got that straight away and he's like, I mean, we made the film, we were involved with, and, and Lee was involved in making the uh, behind the scenes of the jawbone. Paul said, like, you know, give us a call, give us a call, look, come and do it for Kind Revolution or whatever it was at the time. I yeah. can't remember, I'm terrible, I'm terrible. Yeah, and it would have been Kind Revolution, yeah. So I, really, to, my role in Dan was to get out of the way because I, that's what I said, I'll get your access. This is what I do, I line it all up and then I'll get out of the way, let the, the talent come in. You must go and sit on the sofa though in Blackburn and just have a uh, I did, I did it a few times, but then you, then you think, once the, once Lee was comfortable down there and doing what he was doing, I'm not quite Lee's extreme be quiet I'm not quiet it's the complete opposite so I'm I'm. it's, it's better to be quiet <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I know that it's time to get out of the way and it's like Lee just becomes part of the studio and he got he got shots and, and, and access because he just didn't get in the way he didn't bump into the furniture he didn't annoy anybody and that's it. And then once he'd made a couple of loads, we, we, we were in and, and we end up, you know, doing a, a couple of loads and we made a couple of videos for Paul. And, but it all starts with the, what you're doing, where you're going, what you've been, what you've been up to. And then, and then not only just talking about it, he's then producing work. He's going away, I'm writing a book, I'm making a film. I'm not just talking, you're actually physically coming up with a product. So you are going to see these f- plays and films and reading these books for me, for a purpose, is to then move into your own world and to make something yourself, which which is quite tricky and it's difficult and it's expensive, etc. But it doesn't put me off because I'm then I'm surrounded by people quite quickly that I know can do it, but they need maybe something I can bring to it, which is the you know the access stuff. And and if I bring someone to the table, it tends to be I wouldn't do it unless I, I trusted them. You know, if I if I brought someone to meet Paul and they were a complete pain in the arse yeah. it wouldn't yeah. go down well with anybody yeah. especially Paul so you, you end up saying 
but this guy's great. And he go, well, really? And it, so the, the, the credit I would give someone would would be taken on board and it would be, okay, well, let's have a go. And he would just give you a little test up. And then if you pass the test, you're in, really. It's not easy to do. It's not an easy... It seems like, you know, in your come, lads, it's not really like that because we found out subsequently that, that he was with Warners at the time. Warner Music had sent someone in there to do an EPK behind the scenes and he threw them out after an hour. Because they started moving the guitars around and was, can we move that and can we move that? And it didn't go down well. He uh, threw him out. He said, no, I can't have you, mate. You're driving me mad. I knew that stuff. I, I'm like, you don't want to go in and do that. You just want to just go in and say, find out where you can stand and find out where you're not, not, not going to get in the way. So that little bit of a, it, it seems obvious, but people do get a bit carried away down. They go down and start thinking, try and take it over. And it, it's never going to work that it's, this, it's a very rigid, rigid way of working down there because it's his playground. And if, you, if he invites you on there, then you've just got nowhere to how to behave yourself, really. Those documentaries in particular are kind of fascinating insight into, you know, you, as a fan, you kind of get the album, you spend days with the album kind of listening over and over again, and then you just want more. You want to know about the songs. You want to know, you know how they were kind of created. So they, they're a really nice window into some of, some of that process. Gosh. It's The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was the Black Barn Sessions, because I think that was that was yeah. something that was re- just really original and different, where it was basically well in the band playing tracks from, I think it was like True Meanings, kind of revolution time, wasn't it? But also introducing kind of new bands. And Paul's always been a supporter of kind of new artists. Yeah. People you Absolutely. discovered on that show was incredible. That's partly what I'm saying. Like For early discussions, well, who's going to be who's going to be part of the lineup? It like, wow, well, it might be now, it might be Paul McCartney, you know, if we're thinking, well, you know. But basically, he's winding this up, but what he was always going to do was going to always bring in some younger guys in there, that, like Sam Enshaw and, and names I, I, I didn't really know, to be honest. That had been a conversation that had been going around for quite a while. I think it's something he wanted to do for quite a while to do that, his own um, sort of music programme. And I think they tried to get finance and a broadcast on board. And again, for whatever reason, whether it was couldn't find enough money or uh, they wanted to start taking too much control of it or whatever, I'm, you know, I don't know really, but we, it was then like, you know what, I'll finance it. Paul said, I'll finance it. You make it. Again, my, my role really was getting out of the way. I mean, I, I'm not, it sounds like I'm trying to play it all down, but really, again, the technical stuff is Lee. He brought a, a, a guy called Danny in there and they, and they just went down and set it all up. And I went down and just to, just to be there in case there was any any dramas or anything that needs sorting out. I didn't stay down there. I went down there on the, like, honestly, like, like commute. I went down in the morning, watched it, come home, went back the second day. Fantastic to be part of it. And, and again, you know, I learned about bands I knew nothing about. And I'm always a bit like, oh, the, band, the new stuff doesn't really do nothing for me. But listening to that and bit, seeing them close up was really great. You know, really, really, uh, as a bit of an eye opener, really. And it, yeah, a great, a great little idea. I mean, I'd love to do more of those. We'd love to do more of those. I mean, I don't know, this year has been such a nightmare for uh, all the things we had lined up to do, you know, from, from like early Jan, Feb. It's just been, everything's just got wiped out. You know, everything's been like put on hold or it's like walking around with an handbrake on, you know, you just can't do anything. All this stuff's got stopped. I mean, he's not been on the road himself. So um, and all the things we were hoping to get involved with, like maybe go and saw with him and film some of that and all that, yeah, no no chance. So I don't know where we are now. No idea where we are, what, what's left out of it to the next stage, really. You are playing down your technical skills. I, I heard, wasn't there a story about <laughs> you being a um, like a top DJ at the Royal Albert Hall and supporting him? <laughs> that definitely happened. I wouldn't say top DJ. It was more of a <laughs> slightly pissed DJ um, who, who couldn't, couldn't believe he was even anywhere near the Royal Albert Hall out of state. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, you know... Um, would you like to come a DJ at the Albert Hall? Uh, yeah, go on in. It was just like, it's just a very far away, we're doing this thing, and then you end up with a dressing room, which is, you know, bizarre for me, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I used to DJ in pubs and clubs, like, you know, and you have to put your records on top of the radiator because that's all you have <laughs> They're all melting and pitch black, you can't even see what you're putting on. All the records on the wrong side, wrong speed. And then all of a sudden you're on the Albert Hall and it's like empty. It was it was bizarre because it, it was bizarre. obviously I was the warm up man. So you go on, and there's no one, the door's not open yet. Yeah. And it, I'm on stage, I've had a cut of red wines. I'm like, I'm, I'm he could smoke at the time as well, so I'm smoking away in a, on me on my cigars. I'm in a fantastic time. And then all of a sudden I started seeing thousands of people starting to come in. And then I went to pieces. I have actually gone, oh my God. <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to turn everything up. And all the all the all the controls were being turned down because the mixing desk was going so loud, so loud. Um, so it was a very strange experience, but I had a great time. And um, then we were like, "Thank you very much, lads. You can now get out of the way." And we just managed to get in a corner of the 
stage and we stood on the stage all night watching Pete Townsend and Ronnie Wood, Paul, all coming on doing their thing. And you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to move us with dynamite. We weren't going anywhere. We just, we're like, you're never going to see this again. And it was a fantastic experience, you know. Amazing. So yeah, it was a great night. And uh, that year was 2004, that was. So I saw Bill Wall in a cup final. I got married. My first book was out. And I did the album all with all the stage in about two months. So I, thought, I must be doing something right. <laughs> You're like, I'm done. I'm done. I, 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 well, done pretty much, to be honest with you, I was like, what else can you do after that, really? You know? <laughs> and then the other thing I was going to ask you about, obviously, was that this summer has been a, a big highlight for all Paul Weller fans, was the Style Council documentary yeah. um, on Sky Arts. And um, what a great piece of work. Well, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Uh, 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 absolute. Well, I sort of said what I started at the beginning of the conversation. I was a genuinely massive fan of that band. It was, I mean, it was. It, it, it sounds like, of course, you was. No, but I, I genuinely was. I got involved with the Jam documentary. I was, I was interviewed for that through just people just mentioning my name, and I, and I said, you know, Paul was a massive influence on loads of things I'm there doing because I always thought he, if someone from Woking like like him who could do this, then give it a chance to go and do it yourself, and then you just say hey, what you do with it. And I did that. And then the company that made the film um, discovered that I knew him quite well and said, can you ask him if you do, like the, the jam doc went down like a storm. Mm. I think it was the biggest ever ratings they've ever had on a Saturday night, certainly Sky Arts. And then they said, can you ask him, we want to do a follow-up. They would immediately do a follow-up on the start and the Style Council. And, I, and I'm like, no, knew him well enough to think he won't do that because he wants to keep going forward. I mean, doing the jam must have been quite difficult for him to, for him to agree to do. So I went and asked him, he said, no, no, I'm not doing it. No, no, I'm not interested. And everyone's like, oh, no, you know, it's a disaster. And then I said, give it a couple of years, you know, give it a bit of time. And then um, on his 60th birthday, we had a little lunch, got invited to a little lunch, which is lovely, with a few pals. And we sat and had a little dinner with him. And uh, I went a cheeky red one and said, Paul, we're going back to the Style Council again. He went, oh, blimey. Oh. A little bit reluctantly, nah, might do, might, yeah, maybe. Best I was going to get. And I sort of went, went away thinking, well, that'll do. I'll, I'll say yes. I then rang up everyone said, he said yes. <laughs> Which wasn't particularly <laughs> true, but um, they just started working away. And, we, and, and all these things, you have to, we have to find the money. And then um, Sky Arts got involved. A private investor got involved to make it the programme that he now is. Without those people doing it, we couldn't afford all the archive. And then we went away and started building it. And then really, you, you deal with Paul and you deal with his management, really, that, that because people are only going to get involved with that if he's agreeable. Like, if, if they know it's kosher, they know he wants to do it. They all know him well enough. You don't want to sort of do this stuff without the seal of approval. So once we got that, basically just start filming. And, and, and really, we wrote a little script out. But really, we just we thought, do the first couple of interviews and then see what see how comes out of that. And, and I know Gary Crowley. Gary Crowley's a... A friend, a friend of mine, but I'm always I'm a big fan of Gary's work anyway. So I, I knew that he knew everybody from the 80s. They all knew Gary, he knew them. So everyone immediately would relax when, they, when he did an interview. They would immediately re- relax and start talking. And you can sell that on interviews. They're very comfortable. And no one's no one's nervous. No one's... So really, what I, again, what I'm saying earlier was I would put a little team together of people. I would almost instinctively know that that will work nicely because they know Gary is a mate, really. So if anyone's a little bit like doesn't really want to open up or say too much, when Gary starts talking, they they will because they think, well, it's, it's me, mate, Gary. And they forget about the cameras. Yeah. And I think they come across like, you know, we've got Boyd George, we've got Billy Bragg, Martin Freeman, um, and all the band who, you know, it was lovely to get all them guys in there. You could tell they loved, they loved, the, they loved the time doing that, 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 uh, that band. They loved, they loved being around that sort of, the music and the albums, and it, it was a, just a really nice period for all of them, I think. Yeah, you could and you I think, tell it's kind of a real passion talking about the kind yeah. of music of the time and the, the lyrics and the you know the, the the reaction to the politics, all the stuff that made the, the Star Council kind of so important. But there was this kind of twist at the end, which is, a, I, and I don't know, it's too early to kind of spoil this for anybody listening if they've not seen it yet, because you you have to have that emotional moment at the end of it. But wow, what a, <laughs> what a what an amazing score that was. <laughs> That was incredible. I mean, that was incredible. That was. I mean, we can spoil it, can't we? It's, it's, it's on, pop, on, on. Now. We are on that secret for like the best part of eighteen months. That was incredible that we managed to do that because we filmed that in July twenty nineteen. That was an idea that I had, um, and then I completely bottled it. I I, I could not ask him. I, I, really? I could not. No, I, I was. Me and Lee were saying, look, they're all they're all still alive. They're all still active. They're still you know 
why don't we try and get him back for one for a couple of songs? And then you ask him, no, you ask him, <laughs> you ask him. <laughs> then we went, and then we did, and then, and then he, and he, he sort of said, well, you know, have you thought about maybe doing a, you know, maybe we should get back together? And I was like, yeah, we were thinking that, and I thought, well, I can't believe this. But his manager, his manager Claire, was a little bit, you know, not sure. And then we weren't sure if he really meant it, and we weren't sure what was, you know, oh, is that really going to happen? You know, and it was a bit like that. And then, uh, you know, we started saying, so anyway, this um. We could have, we could have called it a contemporary contemporary performance, not 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 revival or not reunion because it gives the wrong impression. Yeah, uh, and then you went, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll work it out. And, it, and it, it really, honestly, we were just we all we all I'd be able to do was get a date. They could all do a date, a time and a date, and they did the rest. We had no idea what the song was, right? No idea why that song. We had we 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 were just told like this is the time we're doing it. Everyone's going to be there, and we turned up, and then we just let we just let the cameras roll, and we just again, you know, uh, sat out, got out of the way, and just in, and, and and I was like, I was like a kid in the sweet. I just couldn't believe it. I just oh, could man, not believe it. Was what a, I was such a magical moment. I mean, it's just just alone was, to hear him and Dee and their voices with each other again was incredible. Amazing. But and there was no more than fifteen people in in, uh, in uh, the studio, and I was going around saying to everybody, no photographs, no Instagram, no Twitters, nothing. We can't, we cannot let this get out because yeah. it was it would be the biggest disaster. As the months rolled on, I I a couple of people did come to me and say, "Is that right? They, they got together." And I said, "Nah, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where it come out. It come out somewhere." So it got back to me, but they were only asking me because I think they were sort of thinking it can't have done. No one really could believe it. And then, then we we then showed it to we showed the film early cut of the film to a few people what I would call style council train spotters to make sure we never made any major clunkers in the film they were then coming back saying that end bit what that's that's just unbelievable they, they, they were blown away they all said they were crying right yeah, and I was thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm amazing. And I've heard nothing else the last three or four weeks. How emotional that made people feel to see that, as you say, Dee and Paul back together, Mick doing what Mick, Mick's, Mick's a genius. Oh, and, and, and just Whitey, you know, Whitey on drums again was just. Oh, man. It's the perfect combination. And I think they, I, 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 and I know they would love to do, like, one or two would love to do more, but it isn't going to happen. Yeah. And fair enough. I think you should leave it alone. But. We, it was just lovely to be around it, and again, just kept it quiet. And then, that's a miracle in today's today's age, keeping something like that off. Oh, no, incredible! Yeah, and, and, and what a song choice as well. I mean, the song was amazing, uh, brilliant, amazing. And, and then, and then we never found out why that song. We never found out why now why that song. I mean, we all learned. Everyone, everyone on the film learned not to keep asking things like that. Don't, yeah. don't bother. Don't do that. Just leave that alone. Two final questions for you, and thank you so much yeah, for your sure. time. This has been great. So, for you, one track, one Paul Weller track for the rest of your life. Which one is it? You're only allowed one. Um, that's a real difficult question. That I mean, I, <laughs> one, one track. daily and hourly, probably, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does. It. Uh, I mean, uh, you know what? I could. I'll, um. I'll come back. What's the other question? I'll come back in a minute. <laughs> so the other question is, one of the purposes of this, this podcast is, um, uh, 10 years ago, I was a radio broadcaster. Gave up because ultimately there was no money in it whatsoever. Uh, but with one regret, which was that I never got to interview Paul. So the idea of the podcast also is to get to interview Paul. So if there's one question I should ask the man, what would it be? Oh, God. I would, if it was me, I would ask him about what's next, what's coming next. I would I would not go... I would not go um, too too far back. It would I would always honestly he just loves he just loves going forward. I was just before I got ill, down here for I listened back on the new album. I heard two or three songs that I thought I know these songs. I've heard these before. It's the first time I've ever heard them. They were that instant of a, a like a they like were that instantly good that you're thinking that now I know these and I went well you know and you can't, I couldn't work out how I knew it. Um but I think it's probably I've heard little demos and stuff or little bits and pieces over the years. During that lockdown we the, the, the first lockdown he was just going forward and forward and forward and forward. Uh and that's it really. It just it just that's if you're gonna get involved with him, I would just sort of say to him, Where's it coming from? Where's the inspiration coming from? how do you write? Uh, what's the process? And where's it coming from? Because I, 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 I'm fascinated by that. I mean, I personally, I'm, I'm like, I'm always trying to think of new projects to make and do, be involved with, and I can never. It's very difficult to keep me fresh. But this man's been doing it such a long time, and then, and, and, and you look back and listen back and thinking, where's that coming from? You know. Um, and as for the song, um, I still can't think. I you know what I keep thinking. Wildwood at the minute. I don't know why I've gone. I've got into this sort of 
pastoral, pastoral uh, phase, and I don't know why. I don't know why. I mean, but let's say that would be something else tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, it's a great. There's a great choice, though, man. That is a great choice. Absolutely. There, there was a, the con, kind of the video concert a couple of weeks. Well, no, last week wasn't it? The kind of um, summer yeah, music. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. There's a new track, Testify, which is just up there. Yeah. Every time up there with the best work, it's incredible. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. This is what I'm. This is my point. It's just, it's just, it, it's constantly. I mean, we went down there and we're thinking, it's difficult. You're in a room and you're thinking, you can't really say that was pretty poor, that can you? You can't really say that. But you, you, you wouldn't. You, you, you're not going to do that because it's one after the other, one after the other, and we're all looking at each other, thinking, "Blimey!" I mean, and it's all, and it's all, it's a cross section of people. It's not just it's just friends, it's family, it's friends, it's. You know, it could be his painter and decorator. It's a real mixture of people. It's not like just industry people. It's just pals and friends and what do you think of this? And you think, you're sort of thinking, blimey, you know, this is just... Uh, I think that's what I found out come out of the Style Council film is I didn't realise how far ahead of everything he is. You know, at the time, a lot of the stuff, like Eddie Pitter says on the film, you know, you, you hear the music, you don't always get the message. You don't always get the message you're in the song. And as you get older, you start realising there's a message yeah. in the song. But bearing in mind, he's writing his stuff and he's 25, 26, 27. And you're a couple of years younger and you're not getting nowhere near that. So he's he's a miles ahead of that stuff. And he's still doing it and he's still writing uh, stuff that's, you know, thought-provoking and uh, the melodies you're thinking, where's the melodies coming from? There's not many people who are still doing it after this length of time, which is, which is, I think, is a testament to. Um, I said at what start, it's a, it's a gift, and he's and he's he's looking after it. He's looking after that gift, and it's a it's a it's a lovely thing to be around. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This has been an absolute, absolute blast. Brilliant. Okay, all the very best, sir, and thanks for asking. Well, there you have it. What an absolute star. My thanks to Mark Baxter, otherwise known as Bax. Give him a follow on Twitter, at The Mumper. And thanks to you for listening. Desperately Seeking Paul returns for another episode next week. Please subscribe, leave us a five-star review, share your feedback on Twitter or Instagram, and spread the word. The world's first Paul Weller fan podcast is here. And next week for episode three, my guest is the rather lovely Russell Hayes. Things. Now, Russell is the guitarist and frontman with From The Jam. He's been working with Bruce Foxon since 2007 and has been the only frontman to work with both Rick and Bruce since Paul Weller split the jam in 1982. Can't wait. See you next week.